All right, everybody, welcome back. This is the final uh, video lecture for spring semester 2020. It's lecture 27, and this is part five, I believe, games as art and final thoughts. So I would normally ask you in class if video games are art. Are video games art the same way poetry, painting, drama is considered art? Why or why not? And who gets to decide whether or not games are art? It's a really interesting discussion, and one that the game industry itself has uh, you know, they promote themselves as art much in the way Hollywood promotes themselves as art, right? Films clearly are art, you know, video games are clearly art. But even within the game industry, not everyone agrees that they're art. So let's take a, a quick look at this topic and sort of talk about some of the arguments uh, for and against. And it's really up to you what you think uh, about this, and we'll see where we go from there. All right. So as gaming got more and more popular, you know, over time, it struggled to be accepted as art in the sense of painting and film and things like that. And the game community themselves, mostly talking about game developers who make the games, it's kind of mixed on this. There are a lot of mainstream critics and commentators who do not consider video games to be art or even to be capable of being art. And it's because of the one thing that sets video games apart from almost every other media, and that's the interactive nature of gaming, right? When I play a game, I'm making choices, and that determines what the game does. And because we make different choices, we're not, we may not all be experiencing the same thing. And the person who sort of best exemplified this argument uh, is the film critic Roger Ebert. Uh, Roger Ebert considered games as entertainment. He is not an anti-game person like Jack Thompson or anything, but he feels, and his the arguments that he wrote... He was a longtime film critic for the Chicago Sun-Times uh, and written numerous books on film. Uh, and that's his background. He feels games can't be art because of the lack of what he calls authorial, authorial control or intention. So the example I often use in class is Romeo and Juliet, right? Most of us are familiar with the story of Romeo and Juliet and their tragic love and their sad deaths, right? And that was done purposefully. Romeo and Juliet is constructed to make us feel for these characters who are from how opposing houses who fall in love and then are tra tragically die as a result, right? When we watch any kind of film narrative, uh, whether it's Game of Thrones or Walking Dead or, or any show that you like that has a big, long, epic arc, authorial control or intention means that the author or the director wants us to feel a certain way about a character or to react a certain way to a certain event in the story. Right, they set it all up so that uh, in Game of Thrones, the Red Wedding was a big deal um, because you know we don't usually expect people to get murdered at a wedding. Spoilers, I'm so sorry, but we'll, we'll get there, right? So the issue is that when people, when Francis Ford Coppola directed The Godfather, he set it up a certain way. He would set scenes a certain way, so we would see the arc of Michael Corleone going from a uh, returning honored soldier to becoming the head of a crime family in New York, right? This is the same in, in almost all narrative media, whether it's a story in a book or a television show or a thing. It's designed to specifically show us something or tell us something. That's the intent of the author. Video games have a pro, have a challenge in this sense that because we make we as the player are given agency to make lots of choices, we don't always have the same experience. And let me give you an example of this. So when you and I get together and watch Romeo and Juliet, whether a film version or a play, we watch and experience the same play. Romeo meets Juliet, they fall in love, they die, sad, sad, sad. Now we may react differently to it, we may internalize it differently, we may have different reactions to it, but we all experienced exactly the same words being spoken in exactly the same way in the same setting, okay? That's not true if Romeo and Juliet is a narrative choice video game. You might make Romeo fall in love with, stay in love with Rosaline and not fall in love with Juliet. You might make choices where Juliet decides Romeo is a big blowhard and she doesn't need his nut jobness and just tells him to get bent, right? Or you might get them together and then they have a happy ending and the houses get together and everyone, it, 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 it's all great. Everyone's happy. Why that freedom is what we crave as, great, as gamers, those ability to make our own choices, to make our own places, where our own interactive decisions, where to jump, where to fly, which choice in a dialogue wheel to make, is what makes gaming so great. It really makes it difficult for someone to lead us through an experience to get us all to the same point, 
right? That's the point that Roger Ebert makes is not that games don't have artistic aspects. Like he, he highly praises the graphics of some games, the writing of others, but it's the fact that we can choose and, we'll, and we can all choose differently that makes it very difficult to judge something as a work of art in the way that we could judge a movie we'd all just watched or a play that we'd all just sat through or a story that we'd all read or a song that we had just heard. Because we all heard the same lyrics with the same guitar line, with the same bass line. Whereas in an interactive game, if that was a game, you might play the bass line one way, I might drop it out because I like drums. And we're having, we're literally having different experience based on the choices we make, which are what, which is what makes games unique. So that interactive aspect of games is what makes it not possible for games to be art in the traditional sense. Okay, that's his argument. I don't necessarily agree with it 100%, but I do want you to understand why some people feel, even within the game community, that games just can't be art the same way that a painting can. Right, when we all look at the painting, the painting is the same on the wall. We can all think differently about it. We can all experience it differently but we all can't make different choices. You can't make the painting background red and I can't make it blue. It's a, it's a purple painting background. That's how it is. In a video game, we can change all that stuff and that's what makes it hard to judge as art according to people like Roger Ebert. I hope that's clear. Chuck Klosterman is a longtime uh, writer. He's a pop culture writer. He's been the ethicist for the New York Times uh, newspaper. He asked a really interesting question, which is why there is no Lester Bangs of video games. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Lester Bangs was a writer for the Village Voice during the heyday of what's now called classic rock. So when rock and roll music, particularly in the mid to late 60s, came in, there was a lot of people who just didn't understand why the young people loved it so, or parents who didn't understand what, their, what they saw as open rebellion of their children with this awful music. And Lester Bangs was a talented writer who sort of explained, even if you don't like Jimi Hendrix or The Who or The Beatles or The Rolling Stones or whatever, Here's why you're. Here's why they're important to to young people. So Chuck our, Chuck Klosterman really questions if games are so important to so many people, why doesn't anyone talk about what they mean as opposed to the mechanics of a game in a game review or why I like this game so much or this game is great because it has cool uh, dance moves or whatever. What do they mean? Right, Some of us spend thousands of hours of our lives playing these games, in my case, tens of thousands. And if I can't explain why these games are so important to me or why they were such a big deal to me growing up or why they're still meaningful to me today, even as a middle-aged guy, why am I playing these games, right? So that's, that's what Chuck Klosterman's arguing about is like, if this is so important to you, if you live and breathe and, and eat games and game culture, how come no one can explain it to people who don't live and breathe and eat it? And that's the question he poses in the article that I signed for the reading. He asks, he wonders how the, what is the right way to evaluate a game because the interactive, the interactivity causes issues in terms of what would be traditional criticism of media. Um, and his article talks about measuring, maybe the right way to measure a game is by how much potential for interactivity it offers. So again, just another way to think about games and you know games in, in a more artistic sense. Uh, the Smithsonian uh, Museum has had an exhibit of the art of video games. Uh, the art of video games is one of the first ex exhibitions to explore the 40-year evolution of video games as an artistic medium with a focus on striking visual effects and the creative use of new technology. Um, I mean, at this point, it's in the Smithsonian, so I think we've won, and that games are art. So that's just there to show you that at least they're putting them in museums, so somebody thinks it's art. Uh, one final thing I wanted to show you is the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, the AIS. This is based on the model of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences who give out the Oscars for the movies every year, the Television Academy, uh, the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, which are the Emmy Awards for Best TV Programming. And this is a little different from like the Game Show Awards or things like that because the members of the Academy of Motion Pictures, excuse me, the members of the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences are actual game industry professionals themselves. So these are people who work in games voting on what they think are the best games of the year. And I'll probably show this in the stream a little bit on Thursday or Tuesday just so you can see the website. Because if you ever wonder, gosh, what were the really great games of 2016, you can go to the, AI, the AIAS website and see what all the game people who make games thought were the great games. And these also celebrate games as an artistic as well as a commercial achievement. Uh, that's a photo of Shigeru Miyamoto being given a lifetime achievement award for all his contributions to gaming. So these, this is a, a, an institution organization that is designed to 
promote the idea of games as art and to celebrate every year the games that best exemplify that in a number of categories. And then finally, just to give you some final thoughts on the history of games, you know, uh, it's been about 50 years from Pong until now. Games were a fad, then they were something for kids, and now they're one of the biggest multi-billion dollar media industries in the world. These were things that were going to corrupt children and destroy our society, and now we show them in museums. So gaming has changed an enormous amount. It's gone through the same transitions and struggles as almost all accepted art forms over time, or accepted forms of media, I should say, to be more general. Uh, the video game is in a period of transition. You know, we're you know we're moving away, possibly from game consoles moving forward. Uh, we're moving away from an era where gaming was uh, primarily around the TV in your home to where gaming is primarily on any screen you have connected to a worldwide network of communication capabilities on the internet, right? So, you know, as we start this third decade of the 2000s in 2020, you know, video games and gaming are basically a normal part of everyday life for lots of people. What's that going to mean going forward? What's that going to look like 10 years from now? It's really exciting to find out. I'm super excited to find out. Um, you know, this is the world I dreamed of when I was 12, when everybody plays video games and they're everywhere and I get to live in it. It's fantastic. Um, so I really appreciate all the work you guys have done all semester. I'm so sorry that our semester had to end this way. Um, I miss seeing you. I miss talking about games with you, but you're going to be okay. And we will all get through this and there will still be games to play when we come out on the other side. So take care and I will see you on stream this week.